I'm happy to be here. Actually, I'm happy to be anywhere. <laughs> because there is a possibility that I wouldn't be. Luckily, I am here. And I was given this wonderful moment to tell you how I used death as my life coach. <laughs> now, you might say, death as your life coach? Marisa, where are you going with this? You didn't really die. Aren't you being a little dramatic? No, I only had a life-threatening diagnosis. I didn't die, but someone else did. More on her later. And yes, I am more than a little dramatic, okay? Then you'd ask, just how do you use death as your life coach? First, you have to meet death. When death comes knocking, knock, knock, let her in. Cancel your wedding, cancel your career, cancel your life. In my case, death was female. You know, breast cancer and all. By the way, it's kind of sexist for you to think death is a man. Come on, you know you did. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Now I'm sure if you ever encounter death, your first instinct is to run or kill it. But you're missing the opportunity of a lifetime to hire death as your life coach. Now, what exactly is a life coach? In the words of the great NFL Hall of Fame coach, Tom Landry, a coach is someone who gets you to do what you're not doing so you can be who you want to be. So, what was I not doing? First, I'll take you back to 2001 pre-9-11, and I'll show you what I was doing. <laughs> That's me, BC, before cancer. It's not that I was a bad person, it's not that I was a good person. It's that I was a person who was all about me, consumed with the SSS, superficial stupid shit. <laughs> Did I have the right outfit? Was I at the right parties? Was I at all the right places? Well, I was a New Yorker cartoonist, and it was my job chronicling what it was like to live in Manhattan back then. And even if I didn't have the money for them, I really did need to have all the right accessories. <laughs> Fendi bag lady, need matching shoes, please help. The irony is, being homeless was something I was absolutely terrified of. I was a freelancer just trying to make it as a cartoonist. In case you didn't know it, Single panel gag cartoonists don't exactly rake in billions and billions of dollars. A little later, I fell madly in love with Silvano Marchetto, the charismatic, funny, foxy silver fox from Italy who owns Da Silvano, the Tuscan rest restaurante where the chic eat to meet. As I entered his Da Silvano world of crazy fabulousness, what I found out was that I wasn't the only one who had eyes for him. There were plenty of modelly, sliver-thin, sliver pretty young things hitting on my charismatic boyfriend right in front of me, and it made me really insecure until we finally got engaged, and then, just when things were getting pretty good, the shoe-crazy, lipstick-obsessed, wine-swilling, pasta-slurping, single-forever-about-to-get-married-big-city-girl cartoonist with a fabulous life found a lump in her breast but I ignored it for a month until I couldn't. When my doctor found it while giving me a chest exam three weeks before I was about to get married for the first time at 43. Not only did I have to tell Silvano my fidanzato, fiance is French and he is so Italian, <laughs> that his future wife has breast cancer, but I had to tell Silvano my dirty, little, shameful secret. My insurance lapsed. I was uninsured. If you can't imagine what that feels like, here's a page to show you. The truth is, I had it, but I lost it. I did have insurance. My calls to try and get it back went unanswered, and then work got in the way, and I dropped the ball. As a freelancer, if you're not working, and how many of you are freelancers here? Okay, you know if you're not like working and generating an income, you don't get paid. What's that? Sometimes you don't get paid anyway, you're right. I've had that happen too. Those people are gonna burn in hell for seven lifetimes. 
Okay. What's that? And you always wait a long Yeah, that's right. There you go. Okay. Anyway, I was just trying to survive as an artist. I never thought that anything life-threatening would ever happen to me. But here I was, three weeks before I was about to get married. Not only did I have to admit my epic screw-up to the man I was about to marry, I was face-to-face -face with death herself, and I had no insurance. Talk about living an unconscious life. If anything, my confrontation with death told me that the unconscious part of me that didn't take responsibility for a lump in my breast, lapsed insurance, and more, clearly wasn't working for me and actually had to die. Step two is die. Even if I lived, certain things about me would have to go, and I did have to get my head around the possibility of actually dying. But this wasn't the first time Coach Death showed up. The first thing he ever drew was a shoe. Don't worry, we're going to come back to death. She's always lingering. As if you're alive, she's always around. It's true, right? Yeah. OK. My mother was a shoe designer. At age three, I started drawing on plastic molds of shoes called Last, as my mother worked from home on her designs. She'd also draw these trend reports with glamorous women of the day wearing the beautiful shoes she created. When I started drawing those women, I was simply imitating my mother. By age eight, I became bored with drawing them because they were just pretty pictures and weren't saying anything. My family went on a vacation that wasn't the Jersey Shore. I'm from New Jersey, in case you couldn't tell by the accent. <laughs> and the shoes. And the sh oh, thank you, Bob <laughs> Morris. <laughs> To a resort, okay, we went to a resort called <laughs> the Lantana in Bermuda. My mother complained, because you know she has a big personality, right Bob? <laughs> My mother complained that a room was way too small, so the owner of the resort put us in a pink elephant of a house on the fringe of the resort. The house was filled with drawings that had captions beneath them, words. Wow. My women could talk. Turns out it was James Thurber's house. This is true, this is true. That night I stayed up and devoured old New Yorkers, Thurber's books like The White Deer and Thurber Carnival until I finally fell asleep at around 4 a.m. At 6 a.m. I woke up with the sensation that things were crawling all over me and found 400 red ants in my bed. It was then that I was bitten by the cartoonist bug. But I'm bump. And, and then I went into advertising. I was hired by Jim, the creative director of J. Walter Thompson, to work on Burger King. Creative director Jim would get up early before work to write these books, and nobody ever knew why he was doing that. I'll tell you why, because Jim today is James Patterson. As an advertising art director, every print ad and TV commercial I drew had the same stylish woman I sketched since I was three. I was always drawing these women. I did the same thing at my next job. Everyone thought I was taking copious notes and meanings, but I was really drawing. At every job I ever had, to the exasperation of my bosses and the clients, I found the women I was sketching far more interesting than the products I was creating. I was paid to create ads for. I was miserable. Until New Year's Eve, I was 30. I lit a votive candle and channeled every single higher spirit I could think of. I would usually write in my journal all the things I wanted for the upcoming year, but instead I drew this. She was a little upset during the meeting. A picture of a woman, me to be exact, with a gun in my mouth. Death was a catalyst for change and was my career coach even then. That was my aha moment. Of course I was supposed to be a cartoonist. Excited, I leaned into my drawing, forgetting about the candle and lit my hair on fire. <laughs> for me to be my cartoonist self, I had to kill my advertising exec self. I worked on my cartoons all night, nodding off during the day in Colgate client meetings like a junkie. 
She, my first cartoon strip, ran in Mirabella magazine the next January, and I published my first graphic novel, Just Who the Hell Is She Anyway, two years later in 1994. A few years later, after that, Bob Mankoff became the cartoon editor at The New Yorker, and he asked me to start submitting on Tuesdays. After meetings with Bob, the cartoonists went out to lunch. Sam S. Gross, Sidney S. Harris, and Mark Gerberg and I would still go out to lunch. There weren't that many women 17 years ago, and there still aren't many women now. But this isn't about death as my career coach. The Phil Jackson of life coaches took me out of the game. That's antenna, by the way. Okay. And then, like coaches and players look at video to analyze an upset, I was given a review. Death gave me a life review. Okay, you're out of the game, you took an earthly time out, where do you go from there? That otherworldly perspective. From your higher, hopefully, vantage point, you review everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, and everything you've ever thought. Yes, thought. There is such a thing as thinking out loud. It's as if the universe has its own channel where everything has been recorded for you to look at when you're on the other side like some cosmic NSA. Talk about scary thoughts. Me, BC, really didn't think about the consequences of my own actions and I had no regard for karma, much less what kind of impact I would have on the planet once my previous moments here were over. But me, AD, after diagnosis, certainly did. And mostly what I thought about are thoughts. Besides flesh, blood, and bones, and on a cellular subatomic and sub-subatomic particle level, what is it that makes you you and makes me me? Thoughts. You are your thoughts. All 70,000 of them that you have every single day, you are your thoughts. Before there is an action, there is a thought. Your thoughts are what propel you into action, sets things in mo motion. Your interaction, good or bad, starts with your thoughts. In the words of the great Max Planck, one of the fathers of quantum physics, the mind is the matrix of all matter. Your reality is consciousness of thought. What death made me conscious of was my own unconsciousness. My reality was unconsciousness of thought. I was unconscious of karma, energy, repercussions of actions, and even my own mortality. And now that I got the wake-up call of all wake-up calls, what next? Negotiate. You saw the tapes. You know how to step up your game. So what do you say to your coach? You say, listen, coach, death. If you put me back in the game, I swear I will do whatever it takes to change my life now if you just extend my expiration date. I also thought about what if I actually was really truly going to leave this planet for good, where would I go? And what would happen to me if, for some reason, I didn't clean up my earthly karmic garbage? I was afraid I would be reincarcerated into a worse life sentence. Obviously, the possibility of being reincarcerated into a worse life sentence after this one, rather than clean up the mess I made now, was one of the reasons that compelled me to transform my life for the better, leave a life, live a life with meaning, and do some good in the world, have a positive impact on those around me, and hopefully leave this planet better than what it was when I was lucky enough to arrive here. So after negotiating with death, I had no choice but to live. <laughs> By taking control of my thoughts, I stopped seeing myself as a victim and saw myself as a vixen. And then I became the vixen. It was a pivotal, game-changing shift in perception that made me try and fight for my life and not let fear get in the way. If I wasn't diagnosed, I wouldn't have stretched myself in, as an artist. I wouldn't have felt the power of objective journaling. Put it all on paper and be honest and open and fearless about it. No insurance? Don't hide in shame. Write about it. Get it off your chest. For this reason, I never called it my dot, 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 cancer. I didn't want to own it. I wanted to keep cancer off me. There is a phenomenal release in writing and drawing your feelings. I highly recommend it. 
Had I not, I wouldn't have drawn what those cancer cells in my body felt like. <laughs> and I wouldn't have drawn how much better it felt to give it right back to cancer. Cancer, I'm going to kick your butt. And I'm going to do it in killer five-inch heels. <laughs> and I wouldn't have started a foundation that offers free services to women undergoing and surviving breast cancer. And I wouldn't have been able to draw from the perspective of having gone through a life-threatening diagnosis. <laughs> Which gave me the arc for a story that I've had in my head for 20 years. 20 years. Because it's this very experience with death that gave birth to... Antenna. who actually, through her own bad behavior, does die, and after she, after she blows smoke in her driver's face, who is asthmatic, gets hit by a, a garbage truck, goes up to a higher dimension where she meets her higher self, Super Anne, who reviews life tapes with her, challenges her to go back to Earth and clean up her karma and change her life for the better, or be reincarcerated into a worth, worth, blah, 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 worse life sentence. And I have death the life coach to thank for that. Thank you. <laughs>